Hi everyone, my name is John Reinhardt. I am an associate professor uh, at the University of Arizona and uh, this lesson is about um, teaching with uh, digital games. Uh, the talk is called Gameful Language Learning and Teaching. So here's an outline of what I'll be talking about. First, uh, I'll just run down some reasons why we might think about using uh, games for uh, second and foreign language learning. Uh, I often use the term games when I mean digital uh, video games, uh, but just games for short. Uh, then I'll go into um, what people uh, in the wild say. That means people who aren't taking a formal class, but they're still using video games uh, for language learning. What are some of the things that they say uh, are good tips for using games uh, to study a language? Uh, then I'll go into some research, uh, what people have done in the field of computer-assisted language learning and applied linguistics on what the second and foreign language learning affordances, that means what sort of opportunities do games provide uh, for learning specifically. Uh, and then I'll get into some practical uh, ideas, considerations that um, teachers or uh, self-directed learners might use when they, uh, or might take when they are choosing a game. Um, then I'll just go through a few of the promising genres. Uh, I'll talk about the concepts of mechanics and dynamics. Uh, that we need to consider when we're thinking about what games to use, uh, and then some basic uh, ideas for implementation, how to actually do it, uh, and then also where to find games, and then just some uh, general just general tips. So first of all, why use games uh, for second and foreign language learning? Well, everybody uh, sort of understands that games are very motivating. Uh, people play games, they love to play games, they enjoy games. Um, are they fun? Sometimes they're fun, but sometimes they're, they're uh, emotion invoking, they may be uh, scary, not necessarily fun. So we like to use the term engaging. Um, one thing we know uh, is that games are available in many, many different uh, major languages of the world. So, uh, you know, you can look at probably about the top 10, 15 uh, languages uh, like uh, English, Spanish, French, German, uh, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, really the languages of the major, um, the, the, the major economic markets of the world. So that's actually one thing to think about is that games are less available in uh, languages that um, aren't spoke, are, are, are spoken in uh, smaller markets or markets that don't have as much buying power. So languages like Hindi or, or Arabic uh, may not be, uh, games in those languages may not be as easy to find. So um, why games, this sort of general idea? Uh, it involves playing, when you play a game, it involves authentic, meaningful, interactive language use. So you're using language in a meaningful uh, way, and that leads to learning opportunities. Games are also designed as learning environments. So a game is, a well-designed game, um, is created to uh, teach the player how to play it uh, without necessarily any um, external um, intervention, although with a lot of games there are quite a few um, resources that players uh, make use of outside of the game, um, player communities, uh, discussion boards, um, uh, all sorts of uh, different resources, uh, walkthroughs, uh, videos. Uh, but the games itself, the games themselves are designed to teach, so uh, it's one reason we think about using them. Um, games and vernacular games, I use the term vernacular, meaning uh, commercial games uh, that aren't designed for language learning specifically, but that can be used for language learning. So these are not educational games, they're not designed for educational purposes. Um, we can consider these as authentic sociocultural artifacts. What does that mean? Uh, it means that we can sort of treat them as a text. We can see them as something that sh while playing you experience, kind of like you experience in, in uh, watching a movie or reading a book. Uh, and because it is a created artifact, it reflects the culture of the designer or the designers. Um, and sometimes that culture is a rather sort of a global hybrid culture uh, that is um, maybe hard to pinpoint the specific um, things that reflect one culture or the other but uh, it's still there and it can be um, analyzed and understood as such. Uh, we can also understand games as socio-literacy practices. Uh, what that means is that it's something that people do with each other uh, and they use different symbolic means like language uh, to make meaning uh, that others will understand. 
So in that sense, uh, games are places where culture is actually uh, created, uh, generated. Um, and then I think one of the big reasons that we uh, should think about using uh, video games for, for second and foreign language learning is that millions of people already do it. And I use the term, they L2 game. So they game, uh, they play games, um, but they play in another language. So uh, this leads to, um, uh, this is a little project that I did that was uh, focused on um, what are people talking about uh, on the internet, um, outside of educational um, websites or um, those sorts of spheres where people are uh, giving each other advice on how to use video games uh, as casual, uh, more informal uh, resources, maybe a bit of intentionality, but um, not necessarily uh, because they know they have to, uh, you know, take a test afterwards or something. So how do they use um, these games? Well, uh, this is based on some, uh, a little research project I did that uh, is in uh, my book, um, Gameful Second and Foreign Language Teaching and Learning, uh, that came out at the beginning of 2019 and another chapter I have in press. So these are just four things here uh, that I can quickly go through. Uh, first, some people say, well, you can play any game uh, in the language that you want to study, um, as long as it requires the meaningful use of language. So what does that mean? That may uh, rule out using some action games or some uh, math games, Candy Crush, things that, you know, don't really use any language, um, unless you're playing them with another person, but maybe, you know, even then. Uh, and then if you play in an informal yet semi-intentional way, so this means approach it casually uh, and uh, what I call gamefully when you're, when you're playing them. Still with maybe the idea that you're gonna be learning, uh, but don't get sort of hung up on that. Play a familiar game, something that you know that you want to play, uh, a genre that you maybe is your favorite genre um, at the right proficiency level. So something that's not too hard for you, uh, not too easy for you. Um, and that uh, integrates a lot of multimodal language use. And I'll show some examples of the kinds of genres uh, that refers to, but it means a game that has um, images associated with uh, the words uh, either written or spoken that the player can really sort of multi, uh, can, can manipulate as they play. Play games that have useful features. And these are things like subtitles that you can turn on and off uh, in that might translate um, into, uh, into English or whatever first language you're working with. Uh, they might have captioning and captioning is a really important thing because what it'll do is it takes the dialogue that's spoken and then it shows you what that is written. So uh, the, the captioning isn't translated, but it, uh, it changes the modality so you can see it. Um, if you can turn that off and on, you can rewatch uh, and rewatch a scene over and over again. That leads to the next one, repeatability. So if you can repeat something, some little scene, uh, some uh, quest, some action, uh, until you understand what's happening, um, and that's really only available in some games, uh, that's, that's a good thing. And then of course, plausibility. So as we all know, when we're learning a language, sometimes uh, the language uh, comes at us so fast, we just wish we could stop, um, ask somebody to slow down, ask somebody to repeat. So in some games, uh, the controls allow you to do that. Uh, and then uh, the, the fourth main point uh, that was made um, was to use uh, the resources outside of the game um, about playing the game. Um, and if it's a, a very big popular game, there will be communities of people who talk about it, how to play it, and they may be doing it in, this, in the language that uh, you're looking to study. And that's a great resource for you to be exposed to different kinds of genres and registers and types of language use. Um, and then if you can interact with the other players uh, and try to push yourself to uh, uh, actually use the language in an interactional way. Um, and then finally, uh, to pay attention to the constraints uh, that um, playing a particular title on a particular uh, PC in a, in a certain place, uh, may, there may be uh, associated with that. So for example, I believe with PlayStation 3, um, you could play any uh, game that was say produced in Japan, you could actually buy it on Amazon, uh, 
and, and then take it and play it on your American PlayStation 3. But I think with PlayStation 4, they may have um, stopped that. Um, PCs sometimes will let you uh, change the interface um, of the language uh, of the game. Um, but uh, depending on the title. So it's something to do research on and figure out uh, what are the constraints of um, can you play this game on the machine you have uh, in the place that you're playing it. So uh, these are some examples of some of the games that people have done research on. Uh, and I'll just go through these, the titles. Uh, so first, The Sims. Um, you can imagine that The Sims has a lot of potential for uh, learning another language because uh, it has all kinds of uh, daily activities um, and uh, household items, things that people do every day uh, embedded in the game. Now, um, you know, when you are creating your, uh, your, your house in The Sims, for example, you have to uh, interface with the game and answer a lot of questions, make a lot of choices that have some language use. So people have done some research on this and they found that yes, indeed, uh, it, it is a good resource. Um, the creator of The Sims called it a digital dollhouse. If you think about uh, what the potentials for learning might be there. Um, moving on to the right, the upper right um, is a game called uh, My Summer Vacation, uh, Boku no Natsu Yasumi. This is a Japanese game. Um, and in this game, it's a uh, sort of an action adventure game where you uh, are a eight-year-old kid uh, and you go to visit your family and uh, your relatives in rural Japan in the summer and you have all kinds of little adventures. You get to uh, go fishing, you get to go capture bugs, you get to have dinner with your family, help uh, cook, um, all kinds of little mini games built into this. And what's great about this game is that it has a lot of the um, captions uh, with a lot of the dialogue that's repeatable. Uh, and because it's a game for kids, it has, um, if you study Japanese, you know there's a thing called furigana, and the furigana uh, tells you how to read uh, the particular complicated kanji, so it can be useful. Uh, and uh, Kaioshin took a, did, uh, an interesting study about how players will use this, um, uh, how could they can use this game for, for learning uh, Japanese. Um, let's see, the lower left, there is uh, World of Warcraft. Lots of research has been done on this because it's a uh, Morpeg. Um, Morpegs put people together in situations where they have to coordinate their actions and accomplish uh, joint uh, tasks uh, in the form of quests. Uh, they get to play different characters and all kinds of opportunities for language use and learning arise in those situations. Um, in the middle is a game, an educational game actually, that's been designed uh, for learning Spanish. And this, uh, in this game, you basically are a student learning uh, Spanish and you go to uh, a Spanish speaking town and you have to interact with various people uh, in the town. Um, on the, the right of that is uh, a relatively new game called Space Team ESL. I think there's a French version of this too. And this is neat because it's a mobile game um, where two players have different uh, parts of the game and they have to communicate with each other in order to keep their spaceship uh, flying by saying, you have to press, um, you know, make sure that red guy's button is on, you know, make sure the switch that says huge baby is on. So you have to communicate actually in real time with someone. And this actually has a lot of potential as a classroom game. Um, pretty simple, but some great dynamics that lead to opportunities for uh, meaningful um, and exciting language use. Uh, in the bottom, uh, there is is a game called uh, Bayelti, and this is a simulation game where designed actually for uh, Egyptian kids to practice um, uh, building a, uh, a little store, a uh, shop, and um, procuring all the different items for the shop, selling them to different customers, uh, figuring out how uh, to set prices. Uh, and it's in Arabic, um, and um, some research was done uh, by Ibrahim looking at uh, how a, a learner of Arabic would uh, sort of figure out how to use this. And because it's a simulation game, it allows uh, pausing, it doesn't have the time pressure that other types of games. Uh, and in, within that, with that extra time comes opportunities for learning. Uh, and then on the lower right is um, uh, also an educational game that uses uh, a mobile technology. This was, uh, this is a place-based or pervasive game uh, developed by um, Julie Sykes and Chris Holden at the University of New Mexico. And in this game uh, called Mentira, 
um, students go around the neighborhood around their campus uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, and interact with different things in the environment. And because it's on mobile phones and it has a geolocation technology integrated with it, uh, it can sort of trigger different um, clues or different tasks in the game as uh, the players, the learners are, are walking around interacting. So lots of different examples of different kinds of interesting games, um, both uh, vernacular or commercial games, uh, not designed for language learning, and uh, a few educational ones as well. So uh, what research has found about using games uh, for language learning, I think can be summarized uh, into uh, nine different affordances, which means um, opportunities that an environment uh, can present to uh, a uh, player or a learner, um, and in this situation uh, can lead to uh, possible language learning. So the first one is something that you might find in something like The Sims, where you can associate uh, the form, the meaning, and the function of language uh, by being given the opportunity to uh, um, use uh, an item or use a word um, in a meaningful context. Uh, the second one is that uh, games can uh, offer the affordances to manipulate time for clarification, repetition of input, uh, opportunities to uh, repeat oneself. So it's with this opportunity to uh, basically stop time or repeat time that or slow it down uh, that gives learners uh, a lot of the opportunity, a lot of the opportunities they need to um, to use language in a meaningful way. Uh, games also uh, offer the affordances to uh, practice to mastery as sheltered scaffolded spaces. So what this means is learning um, when you can shelter it, when you can uh, scaffold it in a very gradual way, in a way that uh, promotes um, a little bit of risk taking, but also uh, makes things sort of easier at first and, and slowly steps up. Uh, games do this very well, and uh, many games, especially at the tutorial levels, uh, are designed to do this. Uh, they can also help, um, one of the affordances is that they uh, allow learners to set and achieve goals and to um, earn rewards by giving the players um, quests or tasks to do uh, so that they know what they're supposed to do, uh, they know what the reward is, which motivates them, and then as they do it, they're getting targeted feedback. Um, another affordance is that uh, they allow opportunities to negotiate uh, these, these goals and uh, achieve them with others. So uh, this is really the, the power of, um, of multiplayer games, is that when you are uh, playing the game together and you decide as a group what you're going to do, you have to figure out who's going to do what, uh, who's going to take what role uh, as you do it. Uh, and some people have uh, termed this as, uh, for example, languaging, which means using language in this uh, meaningful, social, goal-oriented way. Um, another, op another affordance is that um, these game spaces may uh, um, give learners uh, the opportunities to perform and perceive uh, the world uh, or a new sort of space through new identities. So when you take on an avatar, uh, that avatar might not necessarily be um, of the same uh, kind of person that you are in real life. Uh, maybe not the same uh, gender, maybe not the same um, race, uh, all sorts of different uh, opportunities. Um, and uh, there's some research looking at how, uh, how that may lead to uh, different kinds of learning. Um, another area of research is that uh, games, especially when they're mobile, um, they, uh, they afford being able to learn anytime, anywhere, and that then can promote um, autonomy. And developing uh, autonomy is really, I think, uh, one of the goals that we as language teachers need to consider uh, in, in uh, the kinds of activities we um, uh, promote for our students. So when you're choosing a game, here's some things to consider. Uh, and some of this, um, as I go through it, will, will uh, really make sense. So first of all, uh, if you're gonna pick a game to uh, try to play to learn language with, you wanna think about, well, what is the proficiency? So is the proficiency of the students adequate? Um, do they have 60 per 80% uh, uh, understanding to be able to play a game? 
Um, how well can they play a game? So what is their gaming proficiency? And is the game that um, they're going to play to learn the language, uh, is it hard to learn uh, how to play? Uh, how difficult is it? Uh, how, what's the learning curve to get to the point where they can start to um, you know, really enjoy it and not focus as much on the rules? Then we want to think about the learner play styles and their preferences. So what kind of games do they like to play? Um, do they enjoy playing action games? Do they like puzzle games? Do they like exploring? Do they like um, having different sort of characters? Um, also think about what is, uh, how is the language used in the game? So is there enough language used in the game that you can say this is sort of an immersive experience? Uh, is, it, uh, is the language going to be something that's relatively useful? Um, or is it uh, maybe too, uh, too rare, too arcane, maybe not the right, uh, the right level, maybe it's inappropriate. Um, then think about how language is used around and about the game. So this means looking at the community practices, maybe um, different, I'm going to uh, discussion boards, maybe looking at some, uh, some walkthrough videos and, and listen to the language there. Is that also appropriate? Um, what kinds of uh, uh, input is that going to provide uh, to the learners? Because when they're playing it, this is one uh, thing that you can uh, have them bring in uh, and um, access as a way of, uh, of um, enhancing the experience. And think about, well, is it adaptable to pedagogical mediation? So what that means is that with some games, we want to tell students, well, what should they be doing? What might they be doing a little more intentionally uh, to get something out of playing the game um, for the language? So maybe we want to have them focus on certain kinds of language, maybe on um, certain stories uh, in the game, maybe on certain parts of uh, things that they are going to be interacting with uh, in the game. And then we may create some sort of materials that will draw the player's attention to that before they play the game and then after they play the game. And that's something to think about. Do you want the students to have to do these kinds of activities while they're playing the game? If it doesn't pause, um, and if you, you know, you really probably don't want to take away too much of the uh, enjoyability of the playtime uh, by asking them to do something a little more academic while they're playing. So usually you want to think about doing it before uh, and after. Uh, and then finally, if you're going to use an educational game, you want to think about what is the uh, second language acquisition theory or the second language pedagogical approach reflected in the design. So is this game, is this educational game um, drill and kill? Uh, is it just having them uh, repeat things over and over again? Is it asking them to do a lot of translation? Is it focusing explicitly on a lot of grammar? Um, or is it offering opportunities for communicative language teaching uh, and communicative language use? So. Um, in a game like uh, um, Space Team ESL, uh, the two different teams really have to communicate. Um, I'm sure, you know, when you're playing that game, you wouldn't be focusing on uh, grammatical accuracy, for example. Um, or does it align with uh, task-based learning? So do the learners have a goal that they have to achieve um, with, by negotiating with other players and other resources in the game? So these are different considerations that we want to take we want to think about when we're uh, choosing the game uh, to play for uh, second foreign language learning purposes. So what are some promising game genres? Uh, which games and titles uh, are uh, probably most useful? Well, action adventure, for example, a game you see on the lower right, like Assassin's Creed. Uh, this is actually a series of games all set in different uh, periods of history. Uh, these sorts of games contextualize language use in a uh, progression uh, style narrative. So a narrative where you kind of go through and you have different interactions with people uh, and sort of a story unfolds as you go through. Uh, and uh, in this way, they promote goal-oriented activity. Uh, another kind of game uh, is a multiplayer cooperative game. So on the bottom left, uh, this game, Don't Starve Together, uh, in this game, you have to uh, work, play with other people and uh, basically um, uh, distribute roles among yourself, who's gonna do one thing, who's gonna do another thing in order to survive uh, in uh, sort of a hostile world uh, that you're playing in together. Um, 
uh, strategy and simulation games. So a game like The Sims uh, or a game like LifeQuest, uh, these games promote planning, problem solving, systems thinking, where you basically have to build something uh, and understand uh, how things work together um, by uh, maybe solving puzzles or following directions, those sorts of things. Uh, and then open world games and um, games like Minecraft or Red Dead Redemption, uh, these give players the opportunities to make stories, uh, to be creative, uh, to um, sort of let their imagination go and uh, create their own um, game experience out of the different resources that the game provides. So similar to action adventure uh, in some ways, but they don't have as many uh, narrative storylines involved. So the big genre that everybody talks about um, and a lot of research has been done is um, more pegs. And if you look at what more peg means, you can sort of understand what the opportunities for learning are. So a more peg, first of all, is massive. And that means it's run on a remote server uh, and people uh, play and um, log in and play with other uh, people also logged in from remote areas. So in this situation, uh, you can play with friends if you log in at the same time, or you can team up with anybody, any sort of stranger uh, who's playing on that same server with you at the same time. Uh, and the game world continues when you uh, aren't logged in. Um, they're multiplayer, and this means that in order to accomplish uh, some of the tasks, not all of the tasks necessarily, because they want people to play more pegs also as solo players, but a lot of times it requires collaboration with other people, cooperation, uh, and using language in these meaningful social ways. Uh, it's online. That means you can play um, from uh, any different place that you have a connection. Uh, you have the game running on your uh, computer and then a connection to the internet. Uh, and then role play. And what that means is that you, um, in uh, more pegs, you create a, a character, uh, your avatar, and then you specialize this character um, by choosing different kinds of talents, uh, abilities as you go through the game. Um, and then uh, over the the over the course of playing the game, uh, your character becomes uh, unique, and then you can balance uh, with other players as you play along um, to accomplish something together. Okay, so here are some ideas for um, how to design uh, a lesson or an activity um, for uh, game-enhanced learning. So that means uh, choosing one of these games and then uh, using it for uh, a more formal purpose uh, in the classroom. The first thing, uh, well, you need to play the game, be become familiar with it, and then uh, create some tasks uh, for what the players will uh, do uh, before they play the game, while they play it, and then after afterwards. So for example, uh, you may have some tasks before the game where uh, they plan, you know, what are they gonna do in the game? What might they expect uh, when they get into the game? Um, maybe there'll be some uh, focus on some of the vocabulary or some of the things they might uh, expect um, to encounter in the game. And then uh, during the game, uh, and then again, as I mentioned before, it depends on um, what kind of game you're working with uh, and if the game can be paused uh, to really focus on um, the language use uh, separately. Um, but if it can, you may have some activity that asks them to focus on vocabulary. So maybe um, choose a, a new vocabulary item that you've heard, uh, that you've learned, and then write it down. Maybe, just, maybe it's that simple, um, or it could be something like, you know, write a story of exactly what's happening, um, you know, for one little part of the game, for example. Uh, then you might have post-play tasks. And in these kinds of tasks, uh, you would have uh, the players um, basically recount what they were doing. Um, this is sometimes called a debriefing. Um, in uh, simulation pedagogy. But in this kind of task, uh, you'll have the players will talk about what did they do. Maybe this would be um, uh, uh, happen in a game journal, for example, where they would have a journal after they played and they'll say, well, what did I do in the game? What happened? Um, uh, and then maybe there, there could also be a comprehension activity where you ask them to um, answer some questions based on uh, what you know they experienced, depending again uh, also on the game uh, that you had them play. Uh, you might then have some follow-up tasks. So in follow-up tasks, you have them go a little bit further 
uh, maybe they uh, take their game journal and they uh, turn it into, um, you know, what they happen in the game into a more formal looking, uh, more stylized uh, narrative. So maybe uh, telling the story from the perspective of uh, their avatar, for example. This would be one, uh, one thing you could do. Um, you could have them uh, extend the story, uh, maybe talk about one of the things they encountered, maybe imagine what would happen uh, to a character um, after the game, uh, after they played a particular part of the game. Uh, and then you could also have students focus on uh, the game play itself uh, and, for example, make guides for other students on how to play the game, um, maybe a guide for how to play a certain level or a certain task uh, in the game um, and focus on uh, the language that's in that particular uh, part of the game. Um, or they could write a review of the game, for example, and um, really critique it and think about well, what makes this good, good or bad, and especially if you have uh, people who are avid gamers, they like to do it, this might be something that um, would uh, help them sort of uh, sum up their experience and uh, think, uh, have to think about you know, what the audience is um, that could benefit from their experience. So uh, again, as I said, one of the things you'd wanna do is create some wraparound materials, uh, and these are things that students can, can use uh, while they're uh, you know, for any of these tasks. So these might be focusing on some new vocabulary, uh, asking, maybe giving them some guides on what's happening uh, in the game uh, or on the story in the game. Uh, and then maybe having them uh, focus on particular things uh, that you want them to look for that they use for the tasks. Uh, and then another uh, thing to think about with implementing is uh, what sort of format are you gonna use? So one way to do it with, um, especially with uh, maybe high beginning, low intermediate students would be to play uh, one game uh, with the entire class um, and project it um, from the teacher's computer uh, and maybe play it for 10 minutes at the end of every class, uh, for example, and have the students talk about what's going to happen, what is, what, are your, what is your character going to do, and have them all make choices together uh, and decisions as you play the game. Um, and this way, uh, you, can, you can avoid uh, students getting lost or um, students not really quite understanding wh where to go because you'll have the students helping each other. Um, another way, uh, if your students are a little more uh, familiar with the games or if you're using a casual game that isn't necessarily too hard to learn uh, how to play, you might have uh, students play in pairs. Uh, and this can be very helpful because one of the students can be focusing on playing the game and others can be focused on uh, maybe focusing on the language uh, that's used in the game. Um, and in this situation, or any of these situations really, you want to give students the opportunity to choose uh, the game to play, maybe among some that you have pre-selected. Uh, and finally, there might be an independent project uh, approach where you have maybe not all of your students really want to play games, and so, but you have uh, independent projects that students do. So you may have one student who's a gamer uh, help them choose a game that might work and then give them some tasks to do. Uh, on their own, maybe during lab time or uh, out of class. So where can you find games? Well, if you're just beginning, um, I think the best advice is to play casual games. And casual games are a great place to start because they're easier to learn. They're not as hard as sort of uh, the big PC games or the big console games. Um, where to find some? Here are some examples, uh, Big Fish games, uh, Yuda games, uh, and Inno games. And um, some examples of specific games, I think LifeQuest is a great one to start with that you can play on Big Fish games. Uh, and I think you can try it for an hour for free. Um, Yuda Games has a lot of time management games, which can be uh, great because they're usually set in different locations like a city or a restaurant or an airport or a time in history. Um, Inno Games also has a lot of these sort of time management simulation or strategy games. Uh, and again, what's good about these is that they allow you to uh, pause uh, and focus on um, the, the, the rules or focus on the language use. If you're more advanced, try World of Warcraft or Assassin's Creed and set the language to uh, the language of study and imagine yourself as a learner um, and going in, what do you need to know really to uh, figure out what's happening, what 
where can you rely on your own uh, game experience to figure out what's happening? And then imagine, you know, what kind of learning opportunities uh, do the game, um, does the game give uh, a player and how might you create some materials that might focus um, the, the, the player on those to use uh, for uh, more formal purposes. Uh, if you don't like violence, um, there are still a lot of games out there. Uh, the Sims, uh, Settlers Online, Minecraft are good places to start. There's also uh, a whole genre called um, interactive fiction that can be um, very interesting. So uh, a good place to go for that might be choiceofgames.com. And so to conclude, I have just a few tips here. Um, think about this. So just like a film and a book, uh, some games, just like films and books, some games are more appropriate for language learning than others. So you would never uh, have students watch um, a movie as a, a learning task and not have watched the movie yourself ahead of time. So it's really important to um, play the game, evaluate and choose it uh, very carefully. Um, also, another good tip uh, is that to realize some learners really are more recept receptive to gameful learning than others. So if, you know, the majority of your, your students really don't want to do it, um, don't force it. Um, maybe uh, think about um, if you have the possibility of having a special section um, of the language that you're teaching that could be the game section where you're going to be doing a lot of game-like uh, activities. Or think of using it as a, more of a supplemental optional activity. Um, but if the majority of your class uh, is not really focused, uh, not really interested in doing it, um, don't force it. And it also can be dependent on what title you, you, you choose. Um, these kinds of tasks uh, that I was suggesting uh, should perhaps be um, designed uh, with the understanding that games really, for example, don't always offer opportunities for uh, speaking. Uh, they don't necessarily focus on um, interaction depending on the kind of game. So if you're using uh, something like The Sims or something um, like a, a simulation game, a strategy game, um, naturally while playing it, you don't really have opportunities for interaction. So if you were gonna create a task, you would want to uh, balance that. So maybe then uh, have the students play that game and then as a supplementary task, have them talk about the game uh, with another student. So think, realize that games don't do everything. Games are um, only one part of, of your class. Uh, and then think about um, teaching students to play games critically and learnfully. So uh, understanding that uh, games like any uh, cultural product or practice um, should be subject to uh, critical understanding. And think about um, balancing it with um, other kinds of media uh, input types, opportunities, uh, and learning activities.